All right, well, thanks for having us today. Um, we're gonna start a little bit by telling you about our story with drug shortages at Mission Hospital, Mission Health in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, our objectives for today are to describe a multidisciplinary process of drug shortage management and to um, provide some resources to facilitate effective management and communication of drug shortages across uh, your system. And um, in addition, sharing some current challenges we're still experiencing with drug shortages and also provide an update on advocacy efforts, which we touched briefly on um, during the panel discussion. So Mission Hospital, who are we? We are located in Asheville, North Carolina, um, embedded in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, we are a regional referral center for Western North Carolina. We have about 100, uh, 800 beds and uh, 700 physicians on staff. We do use Cerner um, as our EMR, electronic medical record system. And we have a children's hospital within uh, our hospital. And that's important because of the particular drug shortage story we're going to share with you today. So at Mission, we started experiencing drug shortages back in 2004. Um, very early on, we developed a process within the pharmacy that was internal to help identify what our resources were, how long the shortage was going to last, how much we had on hand, and work individually with the physicians to identify alternatives. From 2004 through 2011, there were many characteristics of drug shortages that changed that um, presented problems for us. That internal individual approach was, not, was no longer effective. And some of, those cha some of those changes were the volume of shortages. We are currently right now monitoring over 200 medications that we cannot receive on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the graph that Bernadette showed earlier, which I'll, I'll show again briefly, illustrates this, the increasing number of shortages that we were seeing over time. Also, the types of medica medications were changing. It was more sterile injectables, as we have identified, and they were, um, had a wider range of clinical application, and a lot of them were life-saving medications, so they were medications that we had to have for our patients. The complexity of the shortages were increasing as well, so instead of one drug in a class, the entire class was affected. Additionally, the duration of shortages were getting longer, so we were having to maintain um, alternative processes for a longer period of time. And in some cases, there were very limited alternatives. In those cases where we were dealing with medications that are used in emergent situations where there are limited alternatives, um, we really had to start evaluating um, where we were going to get supplies of medications from. Um, so we had several situations where we had to consider obtaining medications from alternative suppliers. The secondary markets that Bernadette mentioned earlier, um, gray markets, you might have heard them termed, um, or compounding pharmacies. And uh, I'll tell you that we as an institution um, have a policy that we do not purchase from gray market providers. We will not purchase from secondary providers. Uh, we purchase only from approved uh, manufacturing facilities. And the only time with which we will consider purchasing from a compounding pharmacy is if it is a life-saving medication and it is something that we have to have. And there's a clear process for doing that. So this is a graph that you've seen a couple of times in Bernadette's presentation. But again, this just shows that from 2004, when we first experienced uh, medications, it, it, we had a small number. Um, at Mission, particularly, we uh, experienced maybe four medication shortages in that year. So having a very individual approach was manageable. However, when you look to 2011, when there were over 267 reported shortages, having an individual approach to managing and communicating shortage information is not effective. And again, um, a sim the same graph that Bernadette showed earlier, but currently the average duration of shortages is 19 months. And so when a medication is unavailable, it is generally unavailable for an average of 19 months. So the outliers from that are, can be significant. This just gives you an idea of the classes of medications that have been affected. Each bar, each color bar represents a different year. And you can see for the most part, um, the CNS agents have been affected primarily, uh, followed closely by antibiotics, and then of course chemotherapy agents. So what are the consequences that we've seen of these drug shortages? Um, certainly there's a significant time shift from, from um, staff's primary responsibilities, and I mentioned that earlier. Um, at 
Mission Pharmacy, we characterize just our pharmacy staff and the time shift uh, averaged around 20 hours per day, um, moving people away from their primary duties to managing and dealing with drug shortages. And so that is just within the pharmacy. Certainly you can have an increased cost. Uh, we mentioned earlier the GPO um, model and contracts, and so a lot of times with these generic manufacturers, when their products go on shortage, you're forced to purchase products that you do not normally purchase off contract, so you can have some increased cost associated with that. Also, the gray market providers, um, there are certainly stories in the media about the markups that uh, these providers put on medications. And the gray market providers purchase products from a manufacturing uh, plant and then mark up the prices somewhere around 200% sometimes um, for hospitals and physicians' office to purchase at that price. You can have uh, effects on inventory, obviously, if you have back orders associated with different, uh, the same product with different manufacturers and it all comes in at one time, it can certainly affect your inventory management. And last, but of course not least, is the potential for impact on the safety and quality of patient care. Uh, we all have individual experiences and anecdotal evidence of this, but certainly there's an increased risk of medication error anytime you make fast-paced changes in an already complex medication environment. And that is certainly what has to happen in a drug shortage situation. Um, additionally, alternative treatment options may not be optimal. Um, if, if you're left with choosing either not giving the medication or giving a suboptimal um, product, then certainly the care of the patient will be affected. So what is the impact? We are starting to see publications in the literature now um, about and characterizing the impact that we're seeing from drug shortages. There have been several surveys done. The University of Michigan Health System uh, distributed a survey in 2010. It was sent to the uh, pharmacy departments throughout the United States to assess the impact of recent drug shortages and really try to quantify the time um, spent managing shortages. The survey was intended to get feedback from physicians, nurses, and pharmacists on the time that they spent. Um, it was a small response rate, and most of the responders were community hospitals. But what this graph shows is it characterizes the amount of time and then the corresponding labor cost associated with time of each specialty in managing drug shortages. Um, now, importantly, because this is a low response rate, the, this probably is an uh, underestimate of the time spent by the different uh, specialties, and the labor costs are estimated on um, average salaries for a, a hospital that has greater than or equal to 400 beds. But essentially what it equals to is a total U.S. labor cost of over $216 million annually, which is very significant. So certainly um, patient care is being affected. And then quality of care. Um, the American Hospital Association sent on a survey in 2011 trying to um, describe the effect on quality of, of patient care related to drug shortages. 82% reported a delay in patient care and 75% reported rationing or implementing um, restrictions for use for certain medications. As I mentioned previously, the, the previous three slides describe surveys. So opinions, um, anecdotal evidence, things like that. But we are starting to see very concrete published medical evidence in our medical literature of patient care being affected by drug shortages. In the fall of 2012, there was a report of decreased disease-free survival in cancer patients that had to receive an alternative medication. And also in pediatrics in October 2012, there was an increase in the, in the uh, incidence of central line infections when um, ethanol lock therapy was unavailable. Bernadette did a great job explaining the factors affecting drug shortages. I'm not going to spend much time on this except for the, to reiterate that it is a multifactorial pro problem. It is not one problem. It is, um, there are many factors contributing to it, and the main cause for a certain drug shortage will differ depending on the drug that you're talking about. So it's not one size fits all.
Thanks. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened when our hospital was running out of vitamin K. Um, and uh, many of you probably know that um, vitamin K standard of practice is to give a shot of vitamin K to every newborn to prevent a rare but potentially devastating hemorrhagic or bleeding disorder. And uh, so as the medical director of the Children's Hospital, when I found out, I think this might be my exact quote, what, no vitamin K? <laughs> when I found out that we had less than seven day supply. And uh, so, um, you know, we had to very, very quickly uh, figure out what we were going to do to keep, uh, keep our, our patients safe. Um, we talked with our medical staff and quickly assembled a multidisciplinary team. Um, included physicians, pharmacists, nurses, educators in IT, doled out assignments, um, <coughs> sent our uh, pediatric uh, hematologists off looking at the literature to find out what other options were available. Um, they combed uh, the international literature and actually found out that several European countries use oral vitamin K. As we mentioned before, this is the injectable um, uh, preparation that was in shortage, uh, but nobody really uses oral vitamin K in the United States. So we ha it doesn't even exist that you can buy it in the United States. So we had to um, first fi you know, figure out how we were going to get that in place. We also sent our uh, neonatologist off to begin to identify. We know some patients are at higher risk of bleeding, and so to begin to um, put together the criteria for who, we, who needed the few IM doses that we had left. How are we going to get those to the highest risk patients? Um, and uh, then our, um, our pharmacist uh, worked diligently, um, actually worked with a, a compounding pharmacy to figure out the, the preparation and assure that that could be made in a safe way. Uh, our nurses uh, pitched in with how are we going to get this to the patients and have, uh, have it available for PPID um, to you know, get it to the right patients and then get a formulation. This was something that had to be given over a month's time, not just the one shot. So we had to get our educators involved. Uh, and how did we um, communicate this to our staff, all of our caregivers, the regional physician community, and um, our patients in an effective way? Uh, and so, and we had just a few days to get this done. Um, so this was where we ended up getting caught off guard and having to be reactive, not a fun place to be. Uh, we fortunately, you know, I think people just dropped everything else they were doing for those days and in four days time, we had implemented oral vitamin K for our low risk babies. And um, we uh, really, after we did that, we said, oh, okay. How did we get here? What can we learn from it? And how can we do this better? So it was a, a pretty amazing um, uh, accomplishment, but not one we want to repeat. So we said, you know, we have, first of all, how did we find out that we um, were short on vitamin K with only a seven day supply? Well, we clearly needed to rethink our whole processes. How, um, how do we track and communicate? We've heard communication, communication, communication um, all day long. And so how do we effectively communicate? And one of the things we realized is that medication shortage, we had been pretty siloed. And it had really been the responsibility of the pharmacy. And it really needed to be taken outside of just the pharmacy and be a shared process. And that's where we came to the multidisciplinary team. Um, we needed to be proactive in um, evaluating our um, looking ahead at potentially shortage drugs and beginning to look for therapeutic alternatives and what would be criteria for use in a shortage situation. And then we realized we had an opportunity. This, this EMR that I know we've talked about, and we said, oh, it's such a pain to implement. And so, it, but it, we actually had an opportunity here to help it work for us. And so um, to look at how do we use um, computerized physician order entry as a, as a, a place to um, educate the prescribers at the time that they're prescribing their medications. And then um, we definitely learned that there were far more stakeholders who we had to educate and communicate with than we had ever imagined. We learned in those four days. So we decided then to take a look, take a look across our entire um, system, across our hospital, and say um, we created this team, a drug shortage quality team, and the charge was to develop a, this proactive approach. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, we had a transdisciplinary team that consisted of 
um, care providers, administration, information technology, uh, performance improvement to help us do this efficiently and effectively. And the team defined um, the elements that they felt like we needed to address to be successful. And um, those included real-time inventory tracking, um, the efficient use of um, the medication that we had. I think we heard um, uh, talk about the efficient use of, of antibiotics. We also, when we realized that these were injectable medications, we educated our medical staff to, I think we found sometimes they were just continuing a patient on an IV medication when they were actually taking PO and could be switched. So um, looking at how are we eff efficiently using what we have. We wanted to create an ethical um, distribution or uh, allocation of the supplies and um, patient care, uh, the, a point of care communication as I described um, and the education was important and then as we've heard from the discussion earlier, we felt like the, part of the charge to this um, committee is to address advocacy from our institution's perspective. So our team consisted of um, multiple sub-teams and that uh, one group looked at the internal logistics, the tracking, the monitoring the, um, within the hospital. Uh, we had three different education teams, one focused on physician, nurse, and patient. And I have to say through time they actually did merge together because the, the messages were very similar. Um, a clinical decision making and ethics team and then the external logistics, which really took on the advocacy issues. And so part of our communication strategy, I think the first thing that we felt like we had to do was develop a, a language, a common language that was easy for our um, staff to understand. And we used a color scheme. People are used to traffic lights and so, um, we uh, defined our medication shortage based on number of days supply and categorized them into the colors you see here. So blue is a um, greater than seven day supply, but a drug that we know there are concerns about either manufacturing distribution issues, shortages elsewhere. Uh, chemotherapeutic agents really didn't fit into a, a day supply because of the way they're used. So we put high, high concern chemotherapeutic agents in purple, and then yellow is when there was a three to seven day supply, orange less than um, three days, and red were out. And then um, we wanted to communicate that to our staff. So we, this is just a screenshot of what we put on our intranet. Um, we educated people to look there. We put it in the physician lounge on screensavers. We put it everywhere throughout the hospital to get people used to this color scheme. And uh, um, on our intranet, people can pop up and look at the medication shortages by color. And this is updated every day because the drug shortages change every day. <laughs> Um, so then we d had a different intervention for each color. And so for um, the, the blue um, medications, that's really when a drug moves into that blue category, that's our trigger to say, um, you know, we need to monitor the, uh, this drug more closely. We need to be, you know, begin to communicate that and we're going to form a team. We're going to assign some folks based on who has expertise in this area, who is using, we look at um, utilization and um, getting a small team together to a drug specific team to begin to um, evaluate the literature, work with the pharmacist on um, identifying the therapeutic options and, uh, and then the criteria, um, the indications for criteria. And then that team feeds information to, um, uh, we use a, a templated format now to evaluate, uh, obviously we're looking for drugs elsewhere, um, then look at these the substitutions and the evidence for the indications. They feed that information into a rapid decision team who um, then evaluates that and makes the recommendation. Um, they do that in conjunction with the service line, so we have buy-in from, from the leaders, clinical leaders, and, uh, and then they, we implement the policy. And, uh, and do we were using our um, power plans within the computer system, uh, looking at usage reports, and then beginning to think about a re-implementation plan. That's something we learned about our vitamin K as we were giving oral vitamin K and we were beginning to see the vitamin K come back. It was, we had to think about, okay, when are we ready? When are we confident to feel like we have enough to switch back over to IM? So, um, 
our, our systematic communication plan involves the, the different colors and a different action for each of those. So after um, blue, we move into the yellow when we have a three to seven day supply. Uh, we are going to monitor the, the stock a little bit more carefully. And we put this into um, the time that the prescriber is ordering this medication, um, they will get a high alert message. And so that alerts them that this is, you know, a shortage in, in the yellow range. Um, it will also present some the therapeutic options that have been researched and agreed upon. And at that point, it's optional for them to choose those options um, or to prescribe the shortage medication. When we move into orange, um, that is where um, we um, restrict the use to, at that point to the agreed upon criteria that are um, the indications for um, the, the shortage medication. And so at the point of the, where the physician is prescribing, they're presented with an alert. I don't know if you can read this, but it, it basically says, due to the nationwide shortage, um, this medication is restricted to patients with, and I think this one is uh, GI bleed or um, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome um, for protonics. And so it asks them, if your patient uh, meets those criteria, then you click the indications button here at the bottom. And let me see, that brings up this alert, um, which then they have to select which criteria their patient um, meets. And if they get to the screen, we wanted to really make it easy for physicians to do the right thing. If they get to the screen and they decide, no, my patient doesn't have either of those two um, indicators, then they can um, click the does not meet criteria, which will take them right back to the alternatives um, prescribing. And when they click on the alternatives, they can then prescribe that easily and move on. Um, when they click this button, it sends the order off for the shortage medication. So um, then for red medications, it actually is a little bit easier because there are no options. Um, but so then they are presented with the alternative medications and uh, are, have to choose from one of those. We knew that we had lots of folks involved when we were setting up this process and we knew that there would be some, some times when a patient might really need the medicine, not meet one of the um, previously agreed upon criteria, and um, that a doctor would want to be able, a prescriber would want to be able to say, I really want this medicine for my patient. And so we set up an appeals process. Um, whereby um, the first step is we have pharmacists integrated with every service line. So we thought having the pharmacist who has the relationship with that, um, that physician to have that first conversation explain um, our, our policy if they hadn't heard about it already um, and see if, if they felt like they could move on. If they still have the concern, then they can um, speak with the chair of our pharmacy and therapeutics committee who um, has the authority to make the ruling and, uh, and move on. If they're still not happy with that, uh, we created a medication shortage ethics committee. And um, that committee then um, can rapidly, we set up a, a technique so they could rapidly get together, um, probably t a telephone conference, um, hear the information from the prescribing physician and make a decision. And that decision is final. So you probably wonder, who is on our medication shortage ethics committee? Um, and so that consists of the chief of staff or a designee, uh, a, the, a physician from the PNT committee, a nurse, a pharmacist, an ethicist. We have a community member who I, I think when we talked about this is also representing a patient, has been a patient, um, a uh, risk manager, an administrative representative, and then a board member. And so um, the last thing that was of really a concern to our physicians is they said, if I am kind of forced to deviate from my best practice and, um, and this is all set up to make it easy for me to do, that's fine, but how is that documented? And in the future, they're worried about their liability. If somebody came back, how would they know that I you know, chose this other medicine um, because of a shortage? So we created um, this kind of in the background. It's like a stamp that goes into the medical record um, that basically states that, you know, ex-physician was presented with this alert on
national shortage. Um, and it, whether it's a, a yellow or an orange or a red, um, it will say what they were presented with, what their options were, and, and what they did. And so that is then marked in the medical record to show that they were deviating from what they felt like best practices because of the drug shortage. I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly to talk about some of our inventory stuff. So just uh, to, to finish up, a couple of other important um, essential elements we the team felt like uh, needed to be discussed for uh, effective management, obviously, is inventory management. Um, and pro proactive tracking being essential, we, ha we have to have a very clear way of knowing how much um, inventory we have at any particular time. And so we worked with our um, IT department to build some electronic uh, tracking systems so that we could easily capture our current inventory and utilization. Additionally, we have one of our pharmacists who is a supply chain pharmacist looking proactively at FDA warning letters and things of that nature to try to catch these things prior to um, them affecting the majority of the nation. The next major issue is just minimizing waste. When we can't get certain sterile injectable products and we have a 10 mil vial where the nurse is only going to, to give five mils, how can we best utilize that product and limit the waste? Um, we are very lucky to have an IV robot at uh, Mission Hospital and so we are able to use that uh, device uh, technology to help minimize the waste of certain medications. Additionally, uh, we have a pharmacy technician that, that is dedicated to when the IV robot is not able to, if schedule-wise the IV robot cannot um, add additional medications to its schedule, then we have a technician that can manually draw up doses if needed. Challenges. So this is a, it's, it's a great um, process. We were proud with, of the work that we had done. Um, and just to give you a little bit about um, continued challenges with the process, it is very much an IT heavy uh, process, obviously with building the alerts. Um, it also is a very time intensive process for research and identification of alternatives. And so resources are, are still a huge limitation. Um, resources as far as getting the team together to discuss the alternatives in a timely manner uh, to complete the literature assessment and also um, to create the alerts. So that is something we continue to struggle with. Timing of the specific drug team crea creation. Um, a lot of times within pharmacy we are able to, even at the uh, for medications at the blue level, we are able to put off that medication reaching orange even for the duration of the entire shortage. So do we really need to create a team to uh, handle that medication when we need to devote it to something else. So prioritization is, content is a challenge. Also communication. One of the major challenges with communication with drug shortages is the situation of a particular drug could change in an instant. We could be down to a one day supply and Christmas comes early and we get a shipment of 100 vials of dextrose and we're fine for a while. So really keeping the, up, the communication up to date and to the point where everybody knows what our current situation is, that's, that's challenging. In our patient and family education process, we really felt like uh, with our community member involved in the process, we needed to determine a process to keep those folks informed of the situation and what was going on, and we're still um, working on uh, that process. The Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, um, again, Bernadette spent some time on this. Um, one additional point that I will make as far as the merit of the act is that it did allow repackaging of medications for use within the same system, and that helps a lot with minimizing waste. And so for those, small, those larger vials, you can prepare them in smaller dosage forms and use them within the same system. Um, so that is an additional benefit um, of the act. Current state, we showed earlier that um, since that um, act was signed into effect in July of last year, um, we have seen a decrease, July of 2011, we have seen a decrease in um, the number of drug shortages. Um, I think that number is actually reversed, sorry. Um, and, but there continues to be additional work uh, from the FDA. They are really looking at uh, increasing internal and external communication and having um, that be a better process. Additionally, they are working on several um, aspects of getting manufacturers to work together um, to create a sort of backup system, identify manufacturers to uh, agree to be a, 
manufacturer of a product if it goes shortage um, on shortage. And so they are working on uh, identifying some ways that the manufacturing facilities can work together to help um, either prevent or take care of drug shortages when they occur. And finally, advocacy. We spoke a little bit about it during the panel discussion, but I think that this is a very important um, responsibility that we have. We have to tell our story. We have to tell our legislators how these um, me medications not being available affect our um, ability to care for the patients, how it affects the patient's care, and how it affects the environment for which we provide care to the patients. Um, we did, as part of our efforts, create an advocacy bulletin that we were able to pass out um, to folks um, telling our story with drug shortages, um, giving information about estimated time that it takes away from patient care and the challenges that it creates and things like that. And so that helps us tell our story when we need to share uh, information with folks. Additionally, we need um, redundancy in the manufacturing process for specific medications and continued adv advocacy is needed in that area, as well as more stringent consequences for manufacturers that do not comply with the regulations. Um, I think that is something additionally that we need. In the end, as we've talked today um, in the morning about communication and today about drug shortages, it is all about the patient and it all is about being able to provide the best care to the patients that we're taking care of. And with drug shortages, um, it adds an additional challenge for us on a daily basis. But I think if we focus on communication with each other and really identify how we can uh, work as a team, communicate effectively, and share the information, that uh, we'll be able to come out on the other side and provide our patients with a great experience. Thank you. We are a, a few minutes ahead of time, so if there are any questions for the group or for the presentation, and I have to ask, how fast could you get your IT to move? That's always our biggest issue, is um, particularly with these quick drug alerts, it would take weeks to get changes. I, that is a continued challenge. Um, I, as we move forward in expanding systems and being reliant on our computer system for many different aspects of patient care, I think IT resources are in demand across the entire hospital. And so really having the backing of administration I think is very important and having them involved and having them recognize the importance of having dedicated resources to create these just-in-time alerts to improve communication I think is key. Um, and I, I think also what we've helped, what we've hoped will happen over time um, since 2004, we've seen medications go on shortage, come off shortage, go on shortage, come off shortage. And so we're hoping that over time with building the library of alerts that the IT resource time will decrease because we'll be able to turn them on and turn them off very quickly. But that, that is a significant barrier to getting things done quickly. I will say it, it happens a lot faster when you're having to be reactive. Yes. 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 So we have to figure out how yes. to do it proactively. So there's That's some triage challenge. process that goes yeah. on. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there questions in the back? Yes. First, I would like to say congratulations. I think you have a great program going. Um, we also have Cerner, and I would like to know, do you have a full-time IS person working on these alerts? We, we have a, a shared personnel. I, again, I think that just speaks to um, there are a lot of IT efforts ongoing outside of drug shortage management. I mean, there are a lot of quality efforts, safety efforts, expansion, and things like that. And so I think we do have a dedicated person. We have dedicated pharmacy IT folks that are specific to PharmNet within Cerner and also um, IT personnel that are rule builders, which would build the alerts. Um, they are shared, they are not, they, they work on other projects outside of drug shortages, but they know that these are important, timely um, things that need to get done. So there is, it, there, it does require some management. So it's and, not perfect. And you also mentioned that you have a supply chain pharmacist. Mm -hmm. So does that pharmacist work solely on drug shortages? Um, the supply chain pharmacist actually is a system level position and so they, that position is dedicated to looking at um, contracts system wide and things like that as well, but um, we do have a pharmacist that is dedicated to monitoring our uh, drug inventory. We um, pulled a resource from our clinical area to 
to provide that service because of 200, trying to keep track of 200 medications without a dedicated resource is, is difficult. So we did have to make some adjustments in staff to, to accommodate that. And finally, you mentioned that you have a Reva robot. Do you have one or two of those? That is a challenge as we uh, fall in with the drug shortages that we have to pull technicians to manually pull up all syringes mm -hmm. and having a robot, a Reva robot is very accommodating to your institution as large as you are and we aren't too far behind. Um, we actually have two robots. Um, we are using both, we're using the robots for drug shortage preparation, but we're also using them to help decrease our um, reliance on some of the compounding pharmacies. So we're using them, we're going to start preparing anesthesia syringes and some other things. And so the return on investment is, is, is not just solely reliant on drug shortages. We would not be able to do that, but it is, it is helpful to have too. You often <clears throat> refer to increasing regulation. How do you increase regulation and yet stimulate the companies to produce more of your uh, needed materials? That's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> I, I think that's a good question. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to <laughs> take a stab at that. You, you got the answer. That's right. <laughs> yes, down front. I think Dr. Lovejoy brings up a very good question. We actually have an example in the United States where we have done that very effectively, where we have a lot more regulation and availability. Back in the late 80s, we, our vaccine manufacturers went from 15 to 3. We were about to lose all manufacturing of vaccine in the United States. And uh, I think that is the time that Congress really did what it's supposed to do, came in, produced a system uh, that allowed, the, first of all, the pharmaceutical companies to invest in vaccines, make vaccines, keep them available. We still have shortages of that for a different reason, but at least we have the manufacturing capability in the United States for the vaccines, and they are available to the public. And part of the way they did that was, uh, which is sort of, you know, maybe not very popular, they bought, bought a lot of the vaccines and made it available. This is mainly for, primarily for children. So, they, and they also put in some uh, protections for the pharmaceutical industry who are making vaccines. So I think at, at, it was a multi-pronged approach for the, for the vaccine issue, but it seems like that that model, in some variation, mm -hmm. maybe a lot of variation, can also be used some of these drugs that are considered uh, critical. Uh, one of the things that we in our microcosm of pediatrics faced very recently, and I'm sure at Mission Children's also, is shortage of acyclovir. Yes. Uh, neonatal herpes is one of the devastating diseases that children, we have treated a lot of children who do not have, until we know for sure, that do not have herpes. And that causes such a huge problem. So critical drugs, critical pr products, perhaps could be put in a separate category where they would be manufactured. Uh, so that, uh, and with, with government uh, participation, I wouldn't say intrusion, but with their participation. I think that the other thing that I would add to that is that it, it seems like certainly um, there have been some benefits to drug shortages and that it does make you critically evaluate how you're using certain medications. I think where it becomes very scary is when it is an emergency medication or it's a medication that has no alternatives. And to me, that's where the additional regulation should concentrate, is identifying these medications that are either life-sustaining or they do not have available alternatives, and then creating either additional regulation or creating backup manufacturing processes or something like that that would enable um, continued care if there were unanticipated problems. Um, something like IV protonics where there are other um, possible alternatives and really restricting that medication to um, severe cases uh, in certain situations is completely appropriate. There are other alternatives to that medication. But when you're looking at not being able to get epinephrine or dextrose or something like that, that 
that's where it becomes scary, and I think that really is where the, the oversight needs to be reevaluated. Can I just make yes. one comment? So I think a good step is this FDA Safety and Innovation Act that went into effect last July. Um, one of the issues with that is the penalty to the manufacturers. And so if they don't comply, the only penalty is that their warning letter will be publicly available. I think one of the things that needs to be done is um, needs to have more teeth. I think that manufacturers have to have um, more responsibility um, in providing drug, but I think the, the regulation needs to be there. I know there's, there's lots of dollars that we're talking about here, but I think it's, it's an important point and the man manufacturers need to be held accountable. There are other questions or comments? I'd like to thank the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for